everybody. Um, great that you could join us. I don't know what the weather's like with us, you, but it's very wet and damp. Um, and um, uh, unfortunately, probably promoting all that horrible plant growth, which I'm going to be talking about and how we remove that and uh, deal with that on our ruins. Um, but just before we kick off, I just uh, think I'd like to just um, say who we are. Um, so this is what's going to happen today. Uh, we're going to present, uh, have three short presentations. Two are going to be about uh, projects. And then the third one will be about um, conservation accreditation, what that actually means um, in, in, in engineering. Um, and I just briefly um, talk about the conservation group within Engineers, Engineers Island and how we're kind of structured and who we defer to and, and, and relate to. So um, I presume most of the people in the room are engineers, um, but if you're not, then uh, obviously we're part of Engineers Ireland. Um, we are a small subgroup, um, well, maybe not so small, because um, I think we've got great attendance today and, and obviously therefore interest. Um, we are part of the structures and construction division within Engineers Ireland, and um, the conservation group was um, set up mostly fronted by Ivor McElveen at the time, among, uh, amongst others, to try and get um, a conservation accreditation system going for um, structural and civil engineers working with historic buildings. And what that team latched onto very quickly was that actually the Institution of Structural Engineers and the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK have an accreditation scheme. And wouldn't it actually, rather than reinventing the wheel, make better sense to be part of that? So that's what the CARE is, the Conservation Accreditation Register for Engineers. It's actually housed within the Institution of Structural Engineers and Civil Engineers in the UK, and Engineers Ireland have bought into that. Um, we haven't got many CARE accredited people yet. I am not. Uh, um, Aoife's not, but she's ahead of me. Um, and there's a bit of a race going on, I think. Um, Trevor, who will be speaking later, is care accredited. Um, oh yeah, and, and, and just to say that we've got a little team going um, to try and manage this within um, Ireland. And this, this is the team as it stands at the moment. Um, we're always looking out for more people um, and anybody, who's in other, anybody else who's interested. It doesn't mean you have to be going towards your care accreditation, but um, if you're just interested in working in conservation um, engineering, then come and, uh, come and talk to us. And these are a couple of the things that we hope to be um, getting going with after, uh, after this event. Um, and this one in particular is a, a kind of workshop event where we, we think it'd be a great opportunity for um, engineers interested in conservation to meet other engineers. Um, that's going to be down at the Heritage Council, um, trying to diversify across uh, Ireland a bit and not have everything happening at Engineers Ireland or online, um, so in person. And then we're also trying to sort out... Um, a, 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 cinema, a, cinema, a seminar on sustainable appropriate retrofit um, and we haven't fixed a date for that but we're gathering speakers um, so that's a bit about who we are what we are um, um, what we're um, up to so I'll get going now um, this is me um, Lisa Eden um, I'm currently the chair of um, the conservation group um, and I'm going to be talking about um, a project well sorry we're talking about projects in the Midlands because um, Aoife and I happened to be comparing notes and realised that we were both um, involved in quite a lot of projects down there. Wouldn't it be good to, again, talk about projects that aren't necessarily Dublin um, orientated the whole time? So um, when we look at the Midlands, um, it's uh, defined by the Midlands group as, as, as um, Leash, Offaly, um, Westmeath and Longford. Um, this particular project I'm going to talk about, it happened in Leash and Offaly. Um, and it involved six uh, ruinous churches, um, all in various states of dilapidation, as you can see from these photos, and all with um, lovely quaint names, some of which I still cannot pronounce. Um, um, the project was funded under um, the Just Transition Fund, which was one that I hadn't heard of um, until we got involved in it. And it's actually specifically attributable to this area of Ireland um, and is basically as a compensatory fund um, identifying areas that were most affected by um, some of the EU kind of regulations on sustainability, um, reducing peat um, output, that sort of thing. 
um, and therefore um, uh, trying to compensate that with some uh, funding for various projects to to offset against um, the the loss of of um, peat production, etc. Um, and so some of that was uh, is is about generating employment through diversification of the local economy and also restoring part of the economy and also promoting um, uh, the ecology, etc. Um, the, this is just a, a, a map of the, the six uh, churches, half in uh, Le uh, uh, Leash and half in Offaly, um, and um, they're not that close together, as you can see from this. So we thought, oh yeah, six, church six churches all in one project, that all makes sense, but there's actually um, between one and another, because there's up to an hour and a half's drive. Um, but anyway, that's, that's where they're located. Um, and this is some of the the summary of, of that just transition fund and what the uh, funding was for. Now, the great thing about the way this fund was set, or this uh, particular grant was set up for these projects was that it was over a two year period. Um, geez, does that make a difference? And I think we all know those people who are working in conservation and, and trying to stabilize ruins. Um, the year long or rather the six month window from April to October is just it's just impossible to manage particularly when we're talking about vegetation control which i will talk about um big time now um so back the um, we've seen the slide before um this is what we were looking at so as you can see apart from this one which actually i think ethos company had had a um a project on previously the other five were unseeable um and absolutely forested with ivy amongst other plant growth. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the works after we've done some sort of vegetation uh, control um, before we actually started. We just, we started with Clip Hook. Um, um, and so there's just a, an idea of what was emerging. As you can see, some parts of it were still um, embedded in, in uh, vegetation. Um, and this is a little bit further down the line when some of the works have been done. But just to give you a kind of overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so this is more of the detail of what uh, we see, frequently see when we come to our ruins. Um, really extensive uh, growth. Now, what we have to be careful of, of course, is, is some of the growth like this yew tree are actually specifically planted and part of the heritage of the site. Others, the self-seeded, um, what were saplings and now trees um, in the walls are not planted, were not designed, were not intended, um, and now become part of our remit to undesign, get rid of, um, and uh, allow the rebuild and the stabilization of the walls. Um, so you can see that if you, this was actually over a six month period, um, you just wouldn't be able to start, uh, see your building, um, specify um, all your, your works, um, tender it and get it done. It, it just can't happen in your normal grant window. What has to happen first is some vegetation control, but this two year project gave us that. So we started kind of towards the end of 21. Uh, we specified uh, vegetation control um, for all the places where we, we really knew we needed it um, for uh, the winter 21, 22. Um, and then that meant that we could get going with some of the works in 22, more vegetation control at the end of um, 22 um, and into the beginning of 23, and then works last this, this last year to, to finish off. So where we would start um, um, is with, with vegetation control is a specification to to actually do just that, to control the vegetation, not remove it, control it. Um, but we would have, we split our specification into two different parts for vegetation on masonry ruins. One is where there's no masonry works envisaged, and this is for maintenance, control of growth, and for survey assessment purposes, where no immediate repair works. So what we're not asking is for whole scale removal of vegetation, because in a lot of cases, um, this one is actually just outside the Midlands in County Meath, but this vegetation up here was holding on to stone, large stones that were over 70 kilos in weight. So whole scale vegetation removal in the first instance would 
could it's, it's just uncontemplatable in terms of health and safety um so the the haircut is, uh, is the effective thing not only does that allow you to get a little bit closer still doesn't sometimes get you close enough to see what's going on but it does allow for more effective survey it also reduces the windage on the walls um there was one stage when i avoided even doing any root killing or stump killing um now i'm afraid i'm going hell for leather and specifying these at the moment but i think herbicides are one thing that is changing very quickly um it's basically a poison um the the reason i like this it is glyphosate but it's contained it's contained in capsules um that you drill a hole in the, the stump um you tap this in um and there's no spray there's no liquid that's running around the place you know it, it's actually safe um i like to get going with these um, and specify these for the first this no masonry works in position for the main roots um and main stumps so that if you're cutting back trees etc you're actually killing the stump um i think they, there used to be a, a philosophy that um if you instigated the killing of the stumps before you had the money put in place for the masonry works um what could happen was that all the stump would rot and then the wall could implode where the stump or the the roots were and cause more damage than leaving the stem going the trouble is that it takes so long to get a real effect out of any of this herbicide and get get those um plants that you don't want um, in places in places of our heritage um, to get them killed that you, you have to start as early as possible. Um, so after a haircut this is what this looked like so you can still see it is uh, quite daunting um, we've still got major trees growing out of walls. Um, we had envisaged that some of these trees would actually be cut right back to the stump but it was just a question of logistics. This is kind of, if you like, landlocked. Um, so at least this gave us the opportunity to see what was going on in this one instance. I'll just run through a bit, a few more on the vegetation control. Again, here is what happens after you've got a haircut, um, but you haven't disturbed the masonry. Now, obviously some masonry may get disturbed, um, but that, some of that may have fallen already. Um, who, who actually knows? But what we haven't done is we haven't ripped out any stumps here. Um, so this allows us to see what's going on, um, allows us to uh, root, inject, et cetera, um, and get the, the death process happening. Um, so sometimes very effective, again, depends on tree types. These are elders, I think, from the bark. Um, so not an issue. Um, you can get rid of those fairly quickly. Ivy, ivy is really problematical. This is a big, large ivy stem. We've got the eco plugs um, planted in the side of it. Um, and yet there's still um, growth coming back again early in the next season. Um, other instances where we've actually done some of the control, killed the roots at the bottom. Um, and if you're really lucky, um, sometimes it can peel off like this. But this is a this is a good luck photo. Um, it's not always as simple as that. Um, there's also some do's and don'ts. I've frequently come across stumps where we have the eco plugs in the middle. And this stump in particular, you can really see the ring, the difference between the heartwood and the sapwood. The heartwood doesn't transport any of the juices for the tree and therefore putting eco plugs into it is a complete waste of plugs. They should be out here. Um, and indeed, if you, you know, this is this is the correct way um, or, or even in the side. Um, if it's a smaller stem and, and you need to, if you're trying to find some, some space to get them in. Um, there's detailed spec as to how many you need and what you need and where you need. Sometimes it's just really down to logistics of what makes sense to on site to put in. Then we would go on to have a specification um, where masonry works are being carried out. And this is a little bit more thorough um, and a bit more detailed about digging out as much of root as is practical. practical. Uh, without dismantling large sections of masonry so it's kind of more specific about and it's assuming that you've got a scaffold there and you've got the lads on site are, are ready uh, um, to do masonry works um, very soon after. Um, so here's some, I, I'm just going to do a couple of projects now and I'm also going to talk about um, actually some of the works 
we actually did to them and I just kind of watched the time there. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to get onto that. Right, so this is a place called Dysart Callum. Um, and we had a west gable remaining, most of the south wall, um, a big chunk of the north wall and the chancery arch. And this is the chancery arch. Um, but the west gable was probably the, the most problematic in that it had this um, large hole growing out of what was the originally the window. And that looks like it's masonry. That's actually all ivy in that location there. This is what it would have like, looked like when we first came to it. Um, had had some um, trimming back previously, but obviously from a height that was sat easy to get to from um, from the ground. Um, and and the, the the windage part and the, the, the prolific growth was still all happening above. I put in the photos of the Chancery Arch just to show you how degraded some of the joints um, got. We managed to save this. There was a, actually just sort of back from the surface, um, sort of an inch, two inches in, um, there was uh, good sound masonry. So we were actually able to repoint this arch and not dismantle the rebuild, which was a, a win. A win there. This was more, more problematic. So I'm going to go through this one. Um, sorry, I went back there. Um, so, yeah, this shape, everybody was saying it was an arch, it was an arch, it was an arch. So we started detailing up some sort of repair process um, so that we could put some structure back in to, to hold the, the masonry above um, and stabilise it, um, assuming it was an arch. Um, I was finding it really actually difficult to detail something that was not going to be um, really quite tricky to, to do on site, something that was you know, potentially reversible, um, you know, ticking, ticking all of those boxes. Um, and I felt that actually I needed one more site visit. It got down there and a really good look. It's much easier, of course, when the vegetation's been removed and the scaffolds up. And actually, what we what I found, you can't. It's hard to discern from here, but believe me, I um, I'm I'm 100 percent sure um, that these were pockets for a timber lintel, and I was getting them the other side as well. So these are that photo is there. That photo is there. Um, and so what we were looking at was this stone has fallen where the timber beam underneath it had rotted out. So all of this stonework above that location had obviously fallen and it was forming a natural arch. It's very obvious when you actually say it like that, but it wasn't obvious to everybody else. And we had gone through a lot of iterations of what the arch might have looked like. Um, so anyway, then I drew up the options of how do you stabilize that, assuming that you put a beam back in, put a beam back in where it where it had been. Um, I wasn't happy with the timber option in this case. Um, I wasn't happy that we could keep the moisture out of this part. Um, I think I would have preferred either this option or this stainless steel angle option. Um, this was the cheapest, um, the galvanized steel beam. So that's what we actually ended up with. But if you like, that was a process of um, acting as a structural engineer. What can we do to actually actually stabilize this and giving people options and to price and um, to come up with the, the architecture for as well. So we actually ended up with purposely a slightly recessed masonry above um, steel beams um, with a rendered finish to the outer face and an honest finish on the, the inside. Um, I don't think it's very beautiful, but it's stable. Um, and uh, as I said, I think I would have preferred the stainless steel version um, or possibly the honesty of, of a precast concrete um, beam in there. Um, but look, we've got, we've got something that's stable and the graveyard is now safe for people to use and to operate and to now maintain properly. Um, I better get a move along because I'm delay, dilly dallying here. Um, okay, so I'm just going to run through Kilbride. Um, this um, site I've actually visited a number of times over the years, um, and of particular concern was this leaning uh, remains of the south wall, and then also the fact that all the coin stones have been robbed out. There were a few other little bits and pieces we needed to sort as well. Um, so I actually was asked to do a report in 2004, and this tree was growing right up against the south wall and they were asking me um could we save the south wall and I said well we're not going to be able to save the south wall if that tree remains um 
and it was obviously a self-seeded ash. This was before everybody got uh, extra special about ashes. Um, in the same graveyard, you can see the other branches here and in this photo here um, is another enormous ash tree. So to remove one ash tree from a graveyard wasn't necessarily upsetting the ecology very much. Um, and that was my advice as an engineer was, if you want to save your um, bits of your masonry, then you have to remove this wall. So they did. Um, and this was this in 2007. Um, and when I visited in 2007, I was equally concerned about the south wall, um, but relieved that the tree had gone. And this is the stump from the tree. And that's a piece of, piece of A4 paper, um, just to get an idea of the scale. Um, so I think I've just asked to update my report then and give recommendations as to what happened. And at that stage, I was suggesting some temporary works and, and poss possibly wall jacking or dismantling and rebuilding to the south wall. Nothing happened for a long time until this <coughs> particular fund came along. Um, and during the process of um, designing the works for this fund, we actually suggested that we would jack the wall. We got that priced as part of the works. Um, and I was actually quite looking forward to that. Um, this is it here. Um, but when we actually got to site and started looking at it, um, I was a bit nervous about jacking this as it was and realized that we actually needed, if we could, to stabilize it. Um, and the contractor, uh, we actually sort of started looking at how much it was inclined. And what I hadn't done, um, because of the amount of vegetation around it, was I'd only done a circa, um, it's leaning 300 over three meters height. I can't remember whether I put a plumb bob on it at that stage, but I think I probably would have. Um, and then when I reassessed it uh, this autumn, um, it, the lean did not appear as significant. Um, um, and I just commented here that it's not getting worse. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's getting better. Um, and so, certainly not when you look at a wall like this. So, but anyway, what we decided was that let's get going with some repair works. Um, I was trying to persuade the contractor that you need to put some temporary works up here, but um, it was quite reluctant with all the amount of rubble and gravestones, et cetera, here. So I said, well, look, let's come in from the sides, repoint, tidy it up at one and one first um, before you ever go at two. And this was, um, and I, I didn't mention there, we, we use WhatsApp quite a lot and just fly photos backwards and forwards between ourselves and the contractor. Um, so this was some of the communications and, you know, hey guys, uh, you, that's great. You sent me that photo, you cleared off all the vegetation here, but why haven't you done this? Look, can we get that stuff in the red rings done? Um, and uh, stop making me so nervous this end. I'm sure you're nervous your end. Um, so those sort of those sort of conversations. Um, and there, that was the photo I got the other day. Um, it just, well, actually yesterday. And then I got a little peek, um, but I, I want to go and have a look in the ground. There's no sign of the stump any longer. So in 20, 18 years, um, it's rotted out. 16 years, it's rotted out. Um, um, we think. But I, I think it's probably buried somewhere under here. I don't think anybody's been in with a stump grinder. Um, uh, just so same site. I'm just going to speed up really quickly. Missing coins. Um, I'm not involved in the detail of the coins, but just to say that uh, that's the architect. But just to say that I was recommending that we rebuild here. But there was lots and lots of conversation about do we build it recessed? Do we just build it in random rubble? Do we build it in something a bit different like brick? Um, we're actually going for tooled coins um, now. Um, and the, but this is all in consultation with the National Monument Service. Um, and you can just see why, why you might be worried. There's a lot of overhanging masonry here. Um, these would be some of our sketches to allow people to price up what's required. So for instance, this end, we weren't rebuilding the points, just rough racking. Um, oh, and that, so I just go back there. This, I know we're getting to the last slide now. Um, so those are kind of some of the more major structural parts of this. Uh, some of these issues fall down to, um, well, stones being robbed out, but vegetation causing huge problems. Um, here, very simple, uh, low hanging fruit, you know, a cracked bourgeois in a perfectly, otherwise perf perfect arch. So we just pinned and then um, packed either side. And this would be some of our, our drawings that recommending what, what to do. 
um, and some close-ups of the work. And sorry, I'm racing a bit, but I better get off and allow um, Aoife to jump on. So, um, Aoife, I'll stop sharing now and let you go. <coughs> Very good. Thank you very much, Lisa. There's a slight echo here, which could get annoying, but I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so, can you see the triple screen or can you see the proper screen, Lisa? Can you let me know there? Yes. If you go to the display setting thing. It's that one again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now we're good. Is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. That's good. No. That's fantastic. That was really interesting, Lisa. Um, a lot of my projects tend to look more like Lisa's projects there, but this is um a different one we were brought in on this year. So typically um we'd be part of we'd be the design team <laughs> ourselves, but this, this job was an interesting one. Um, my name is Aoife Howard, so I'm a structural engineer working in conservation. Um, I'm an SPAB scholar, and I've just finished my master's in building conservation. And I'm also part of the Engineers Ireland Conservation Group. So I am, um, so for this role, so my role in this was as a conservation engineer, not as a structural engineer. So we worked alongside for this project, Mark Murphy of Mark Murphy Consulting and Kira Nguyen of Civil and Structural Advice, Engineering Advisors Limited. Um, and the contractor for this job was Mackie Plant based in Nina. So I suppose my role was um, grant application. I was involved in the notifications. Um, we were obviously offering advice from a conservation point of view, um, supervising the works and the final reports for the drawdown of the funding at the end. Um, this job was um, funded under the Historic Structures Fund 2023, and um, it was it's one of this one of the various conservation grants that we work with. I think Lisa mentioned there the multi year project she had. This one had to be worked on within the the one year. So. One year is six months because we do the grant applications, I suppose, in January, February time. And um, the grants are announced in April. And then once they're announced in April, we have until typically the end of October to the first or second week in November to get all these works um, finished and signed off. So it's quite a tight um, time frame for all these projects. Um, so as a uh, so I said, yes, as I mentioned, the conservation engineer. So I'm not involved in the structural design that we left that to Mark and Karen. That's their expertise. I don't typically work with a lot of bridges, so we're happy to defer there. Um, the grant application, we applied to Offaly County Council for the Historic Structures Fund. This was stream two. So this one had offers and grants up to 200,000 euros for projects. Um, the criteria is it's a larger enhancement or a significant refurbishment project involving historic structure where a clear benefit to the community and the public is demonstrated. So I suppose this is within the domain of Burr Castle. So this is quite open to the public. I think they have up to 100,000 visitors a year. So this is quite visible and quite open to the public and it hits all the criteria for the Historic Structures Fund Stream 2. Um, the notifications that involved were this, we had a section 12 notification and a section 57 notification. So section 12 is a notification to national monuments that we are undertaking the works. Um, we typically send away our specification and things like that, and we send it off to national monuments and wait for feedback that they're happy to proceed, that they accept our works. Um, they sent back a condition that if we do disturb the ground, we bring in an archaeologist, which is was absolutely fine. In this case, we didn't disturb the ground. We took away the bridge and we repaired the deck and we repaired the, the abutments at either end, but actually disturbing the ground wasn't an issue for this project. So our Section 57 application, our notification, is a different notification. This is one to the council. So we had to apply to Offaly County Council for exempted development. So this is for works which would not materially affect the character of the protected structure and as a result would not require planning permission. So this was another one we had to, um, it was typically the same paperwork we sent away, it was the specification methodology and how we we're undertaking the works. Um, they got to send four conditions back to us. 
So all this takes time, I suppose, within our six month time frame. So it's something to consider if you're undertaking these kind of projects. The so four conditions were including a conservation engineer to oversee the project, which was fine. We were involved at that stage um, to send the survey to the Irish Architectural Archive. So I suppose a record of what was their pre and post works on the of the bridge. Um, we were to retain as much historic fabric as possible and that the deck was and the new timber deck was to be sourced from the estate or an equivalent um, forestry. Um, so that was that was what our that's what was involved in it. And then I suppose the, the end then it was a final drawdown post works for the grant. So that that was the extent of my involvement, which is yeah unusual for my projects, but it was quite an interesting one. It was nice to work with a, a design team and a big team of well, not a big team, but a, a different structure of a team than my typical projects. So I suppose the history of the site, um, this bridge, uh, this suspension bridge, it was it was built between 1803 and 1826 and by William Par William Parsons, who'd be Lord Ross, Lord of, of Burr Castle. Um, it is a protected structure and it is also on the NIAH, the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage. It crosses the Camcor River in Burr Castle Domain and if you can see there that the Burr Castle is just here and you can see that the moat going around the outside and this is just right beside it so it's it's quite close to the castle within the domain and for a scope then this is the tele this is the telescope and the domain goes off in this direction and all around and this is the town of Burr of course beside it. So looking at the history of it I guess this um, the, some of the earlier maps, the six inch maps are circa 1840 and the, the bridge is on the map at that point. It's called a chain bridge. So this wouldn't have been, it would be quite modern, quite new at the time when it was, it was it went on the, the map. Um, so when I look at early sus suspension bridges, um, I guess the really early ones are probably in Tibet in the 15th century. Um, the last of which I read was washed away in 2004. But when I Google the oldest modern suspension bridges, the oldest seems to be on record is the Menai Bridge in Wales. And that was built between 1819 and 1826. And it opened on the 30th of January, 1826. So this bridge is of a similar age. And as it's, it's recorded in existence in 1826, it was built between 1803 and 1826. So it, it's as early as there were early modern suspension bridges. So it's a very important structure, I suppose, within the history of the country and within the history of Europe even, I think it's, it's, it's up there as some of the oldest, one of the oldest suspension bridges in Europe. So I first came across the bridge in 2017, I was on the SPAB scholarship. I was lucky enough to spend a week on the estate and I got to explore it a lot. And I noted at that point that it was, it was closed and it was closed down for a long time, the bridge was. So I was delighted to see that it got funding earlier on in the year. And then I was very happy to be involved in it as, as things worked out in the end, it was great. So I suppose our approach um, to, these, to the repairs different from the masonry there was a bit to look at on this one so um we had to go and survey the bridge again alongside mark and kieran did their bit as well so we all had we're looking at different areas but i'm just going to go through i suppose the materials is the point of view that's specifically what i was looking at rather than structure as i typically would be so from a materials point of view the issues that i found and we as we looked at it was the connections um i think you'll find that we saw the connections right at the at the at the top at the to the concrete abutments we saw that they were failing and they'd failed before and there'd been repairs and there was a lot going on with them um the deck itself was quite dangerous um you could see holes in it it wasn't safe to walk on and it hadn't been for quite a number of years and we also saw that the stringers underneath the decks as well they were timber as well and they were all in quite a poor condition as well and then the concrete was falling, I suppose, at the abutments, at uh, the supports. And then I don't have a photograph of it here, but the, the stone at each side as well was also in need of repair while we were at it. It was part of the, the, the whole works. So once we had a good survey and we had a good look at it, um, these were the issues we came across. And then we had to write a specification and methodology. And again, this was part, of, this formed part of the section 12 and section 57 notifications that we had sent away later. So we used, yeah, we obviously took everything on board that we'd looked at. We got our specification methodology organized and sent away for our permissions and waited for feedback on that. And in the meantime, the jobs obviously had to be tendered and a contractor had to be appointed. So, 
then our approach, our next step then was to we took the the bridge was taken away to a workshop it wasn't safe to work over a river i suppose we had quite a few storms actually while and the river the height of the river changed rapidly over the course of the couple of weeks and months that the bridge was in the workshop so it was definitely the right thing to do but we also needed to repair the concrete abutments and the decks weren't in a good condition so really we had to take it away to the workshop so Mackie's did a fantastic job of um they were very easy to deal with they got their decks they got it they managed to dismantle it um not even dismantle I suppose it's just to take it apart what needs to be it wasn't the whole thing was dismantled and we, I came to the repair shop every week and we had a good look and we discussed quite a lot of what was going on. Um, they removed the paint so we could actually see exactly what was happening at different joints. Um, it was quite interesting to see that I think the estate had a forge and they'd done many repairs themselves over the years. So there was a huge variation in the quality of previous repairs and what had been done and what had been undertaken. And Mackey's were very good at recording as they went. So they had just... The survey was on site at all times and everything that they came across was noted on this and it was we have a copy of it at the end it was finally drafted up properly but it was great to have it on site and just to be able to see what was happening as we moved along um so with conservation principles we always we want to retain obviously as much of the original material as we could we could make whatever we if, if, there was, if we were doing anything new that it could be reversible if possible. And then we wanted to control how visible our intervention was to show that what new bits were new and what old bits were clearly original as well. So we um we had yeah so we had a good look. So we went through our site. So just having a look at the pictures here, um you can see that the the connections are wires. It was it was wrought iron ours, but we had to use mild steel, so um, we had to have a look through the materials and see what was the practical. Um, we had to use, we had to have a look and see the um, what is available. So wrought iron is no longer in; it's it's not produced anymore. They stopped producing it in nineteen seventy three. So an option would be to wait for an anchor to come in. That <laughs> tends to be an answer I get sometimes when I go to the. The blacksmiths and ask for when do you think we'll have it um and the quality varies as well so and sometimes you have to think are we destroying something else so we have this material or what's what is our option so and the quality and the cost of course can vary as well because it's it's a limited resource so we looked at different guidance and we looked at the historic england's guidance and the closest alternative is a mild steel um its carbon content is two percent higher than the wrought iron, but it's a very, very similar product. Um, and if it's zinc plated or it's painted, it, it, they take it, they accept it as an alternative to wrought iron in places where it's just not enough, it's not possible to get the wrought iron that we, we wanted. Um, so we replaced it where it was necessary only. So we had a look at everything and you can see in the middle top picture there, you can see the quality of what the connections was like. So we had to have a look at how we were gonna connect it back to the abutments and we needed a brand new clamp. Um, and we put in, you can see the picture below was a, a template that the guys had made up. And I think it was an honest intervention. It was clearly a new intervention, but it was solid and it was, um, we were quite happy with the solution. We have had to go through Offaly County Council to make sure that they were happy. Um, but from an engineering point of view, we were, I think the, strip, the bridge engineers and myself were both content. We're all content that it was, it hit the criteria and it was strong enough. And it, I think we saw the cables above, they just, they wore over the years. This seemed to be just a good, strong alternative. Um, after the workshop, after all the repairs were carried out, um, it was brought to a different part of the workshop where it was painted. Now the painting was, it actually took quite a while. There was a lot of coats. The initial coat was the zinc primer. Um, it was Hempadura was the brand we used. Um, so that was that was put on first. Then there was an intermediate coat of an, a different, and a micaceous oxide was added. And then a top coat was a polyurethane. So there's, sorry, three coats um, added to it. The railings had a slightly different top coat, just that was the one that was recommended. Um, so we just, but we tried to do as little as possible, but as much as necessary, that's my, the conservation principles. 
Um, so these are kind of the pictures that we have back in situ. I don't have a picture without the scaffolding underneath, unfortunately, but um, Mackey's provided then a drawing at the end and they showed everything that they did. So we have a good record of exactly what was undertaken for this work and what was original and what was what had been modified over the years anyways and what we were and what our modifications were so it was really good to have that as a record post works um this um the pictures on so we used lime repairs on the 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 stone abutments as the steps up to to the piers and then on the concrete piers then we had there was a zinc oxide primer over the reinforcing and then it was um, concrete spall repairs and then and there was a new deck as well the deck did come from the estate um it was timber so Burr estate is quite large and they have their own forestry so it was nice to be able to use the forestry the timber from the forestry straight back down on the deck which was it worked out well we did put some um decking strips just to make it less slippy because it can get it's, it's quite wet and it's quite exposed at that point so it is so we, you can't do these projects without, I suppose, a good, strong team. So we had, obviously, great clients at Burr Castle. Um, we had Offaly County Council were highly involved in helping or providing financial support, but also overseeing and commenting and approving different steps along the way as we went along. Uh, National Monuments similarly were involved. And then, of course, we had the Bridget, the design team. So alongside myself, we had Mark Murphy and Kieran Rowan involved in Again, we were all up and down every week while the works were on site, which is important for us all. We all had different involvement in different bits, and it was quite important for us all to be there. And then Mackey's, I think, did a fantastic job. Um, they they were very easy to deal with. They were very good at communicating, and they were very good at providing any information we needed, which was it was just it was great to deal with them. I highly recommend them. So. I just want to thank you all for listening today. It's a slightly different project, I suppose, than I typically work on. And it was one that I learned an awful lot on. And it's what I think I enjoy about these conservation projects. You, you do learn something on every job and there's a lovely history that tends to go with them as well that makes very that makes for very interesting work. Um, so all these projects, my thoughts then are, yeah, all these projects are a different solution. You need a very supportive client who's willing to um, support you on this but also realize that we sometimes find things that we don't expect along the way and we need to change things and we need to a lot of open communication really helps the whole process and um, you need a good team you need a design team to try and get everything across the line to get all the communications clear to get all the permissions lined up and then you need financial support because it's very hard to get project projects like this over the line when there's things like the housing crisis and stuff. We have to realize the importance of this history in our country. And the reason we get tourists coming to this country is to look at these beautiful structures that are dotted around the place. And it's really important. And we're really grateful for the financial support that these projects receive. So I just want to thank you all for your time. And I think we'll do questions at the end. So I will. So I'll pass you on to Trevor now. Thank you very much. Great. Well done, Aoife. That was fantastic. It's a slightly different one from my usual work, but it's good. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, I'm down to see it. I'll be down in Bear soon anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah. There you go. Eva, how are you doing? Right, I'm trying to just get my screen up, so just bear with us a sec. Can you all see that? Yeah, that's great, Trevor. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, yeah, my, my talk is going to be on, obviously, the accreditation process, um, having undertaken that about four years ago now myself. Um, or, oh, sorry, yeah just over three and a half years ago. And we have got a dearth of 
conservation accredited engineers here in Ireland. And we desperately need more people to become accredited. And I know Aoife and Lisa are both in the process of getting their um, submissions finalised um, and hopefully we'll be on the register pretty soon. Um, but this is my personal perspective um, on my application process in becoming care accredited. And I'm going to um, limit my time so as at least we've got some time for questions at the end. So why care? Well, the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Institution of Structural Engineers wanted to raise the standard of conservation engineers across the industry. Care was established for those suitably qualified who can demonstrate a defined level of competency in the application of conservation within the construction process. And there is now a bilateral agreement to allow for Chartered Engineers of Engineers Island with appropriate conservation experience to apply to join care. The register is maintained and updated by the Institution of Civil Engineers, and the Institution of Civil Engineers is the main source of information of how to apply to join care. And there is a link to this section in the ICE website from the Engineers Island website as well. So the application process consists of two parts. One, the first part is a submission of an application, and then the second part is an interview with two conservation accredited engineers. Each interview will have accredited, we've been accredited for in excess of two years as a minimum requirement. For both elements of the application process, there is a document available on the IC website and it's entitled, as you can see there, Conservation Accreditation Register for Conservation Engineers. And it's a guidance document. And the latest version of that is actually version three, um, which was published on the 19th of May last this year, sorry. This is an essential resource and is actually kind of almost crucial to help you get through the process. So part one submission of an application, um, that's basically you kind of just, there's pro formers on the IC website and you fill in accordingly and it's three pages long. Um, and one tip I would give is there's a part in there where it asks for your philosophy on conservation. And I would seriously kind of look at that and really come up with something that is your philosophy, but also takes on board the philosophy of ICOMOS as well, um, because I think the two run hand in hand. So submission, you need to then also have five case studies and they need to be five conservation related projects completed in the last five years. And they can be end of any size. They don't need to be kind of great big, massive multi-million pound projects. They can be very, very simple kind of almost 20, 30,000 euro projects, but if they've got a really big conservation element and you've kind of been fully involved in that, in some ways, the actual accreditation um, people that will be kind of reviewing your um, application will in some ways prefer these to maybe a multi-million pound project that you've been involved in and you only had a very small involvement. Um, you use a case study template from the IC website and there are seven pages to be filled out for each case study. Um, and they split that up into effectively five units. And the first unit is called cultural significance. The second one is aesthetic qualities and, and, um, and values. The third is investigative materials and technology. And the fourth is social and financial issues. And the fifth is actually implementation and management of the conservation works. You can then add to this with drawings and schedules of works and photographs specific to that particular project and as you seem to deem appropriate. There's also the need to put a CV there of your conservation experience and this is limited to 1000 words in length. Um, I started working in conservation projects in the UK in 1984 so personally I actually found it quite difficult to fit within the 1000 word limit. Um, the You then have to kind of do your CPD and you have to submit your um, personal development record for the last three years and also your development um, kind of um, what you're going to be looking at doing in the next year ahead. Um, and completion of all of this, I think that in personally, my, my, my application took about 100 hours to put together in total. Um, and this, you then have to kind of submit your application fee and my submission was made in October 2019. Strangely enough, the application fee is still exactly the same as what it was back in 2019. So um, that's kind of 
kind of showing quite good value now, I think, based on the way the other prices have increased dramatically. So currently this is £250 to make the application and then £65 annually to make sure it make kind of keep your subscription current. So you then get a notification of whether your application is deemed acceptable or not. Um, and if it's not deemed acceptable, they'll give you guidance as to what you need to do to make it acceptable to move forward to the interview process. Now, due to the high number of applications at the end of 2019 and COVID-19 breaking out, it was early 2020 before I actually got any notification um, of what was going to happen. And I got kind of just pushed straight through to the interview process. The interview process considered, considered, consisted of a panel of two conservation accredited engineers, um, of which one was from Ireland. Um, anybody can remember their charging review, all I can say is that it's not too dissimilar in how that will occur. You feel anxious, you feel nervous, and you do wonder afterwards, did I give a good account of myself? And you always wonder, oh, damn, there's kind of one answer there that I'm pretty sure that has really, really kind of not convinced them or has not got me across the line. Um, early spring 2020 was when I was notified um, that I could call myself a conservation accredited engineer and that my details have been added to the register. Um, currently, as I said, th at the moment in Southern Ireland, there is a massive dearth of, en of conservation accredited engineers. There's actually only four of us registered, of which I believe um, one of us is actually now retired. Um, so there's actually only three of us that are actually in active practice. Um, so the key dates for kind of the, inter the process kind of going forward. So unfortunately, the last application date was the 23rd of October, but the interviewing period for that is actually next year in the 15th to the 30th of January. So the next application deadlines for 2024 are the 26th of February, the 24th of June, and the 25th of October. Um, so anybody that's looking to um, do an application next year, you need to be highly aware of, of those dates. Um, and then the interviewing periods kind of follow sometime after that. So February's is in May, um, June's are in September, and October's will be in January. And the confirmation at the moment is that once you've had your interview, um, you'll be notified via email no later than four weeks after that as to whether you were successful or what you need to do to kind of bring you up to being able to be care accredited. So I'm aware that we need some time for questions. So from my personal perspective, was it worth it? And my answer to that is yes. Now I've changed kind of, I did this presentation back in 2021, so I've changed some of it to make it more relevant to, to now. So the picture you can see there is kind of a recently completed bridge restoration project. Um, there's some really discreet stuff that you can't see there where we actually tied one um, gable of the uh, gable end of the bridge back to the main structure by using stainless steel pins and then using um, the dust from the installation of those pins to then mask where those pins went in. But since the beginning of 2022, such has been the effect of obtaining accreditation that the small SME that I do run, um, we made the decision to only accept new projects that have a conservation element to them. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a protected structure or a national monument um, because of there are a lot of projects that still have a conservation element, especially anything built over 100 years ago, where you need to be commensurate of the materials that were used. Um, and with that, I know it's a kind of quick fly through, but I know that the um, the presentation is going to be available to everybody via PDF afterwards, um, and also the links um, kind of to the relevant parts of the Institution of Civil Engineers website can 